Hello and welcome to the Discovery Roundtable, the episode-by-episode discussion show for Star Trek Discovery from the perspective of Foundry authors and Star Trek Online players. I'm your host, Drogan1701, and uh, making his return again, uh, hopefully his uh, cold is better now, is Green Dragoon. Hello. And uh, joining us for the first time is a longtime Foundry author and a community member. Please welcome Bazag. Hello. Uh, it's Thanks for having me. And uh, if you could just introduce yourself uh, very briefly, Bazag, for those who don't know you. Um, I created, what, 12 Foundry missions, I think. I haven't really counted them for a while. But, um, yeah, Australian, uh, been here, has been involved with Star Trek Online since... It's been, like, about a month in the game. Like, um, the game launch that I've been here, been foundering since the beginning, um, been annoying you guys in uh, the Foundry Roundtable as often as I can anyway. All right, so uh, we are going to discuss the uh, episode number six for Star Trek Discovery, Letha, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. I have no idea if I am or not. Is it L- um, Letha or Lithe? Lithe? I, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, I, w- I would think Lithe would be L-I, but yeah, I really don't know how to pronounce it either. I, I, think, I think it's a Greek reference or something could, um, could be African could be maybe someone will tell us uh, this is not something I've seen you know in, in all the online discussions of, of exactly what that is referencing but I'll tell you what uh, about online discussions so I, I've been kind of keeping an eye out you know among my my Twitter friends uh, you know what is the big discussion topic from each episode so like the last last week's episode it was the swearing <laughs> yeah <laughs> and, and uh, uh th- this week's episode the the biggest discussion on my on my twitter feed was about the disco shirts really that uh, was the biggest what? discussion <laughs> yeah yeah uh, uh, pe- people uh, they have strong opinions one way or the other <laughs> um on those uh i i think they're kind of cool i think it my guess is you know maybe like the intention behind this is like it's it's the ship's unofficial nickname that the crew gave it and that someone on the crew design these shirts you know it's not like an official starfleet thing no it, it would be i would definitely say that it would be uh an off-duty kind of uh, shirt uh, to wear so it would be like a crew um crew building exercise kind of thing that uh, yeah. unity pretty much and, you know like if, if one of the other ships made one you know like if, if someone on the enterprise made one it would say big e on it or something like that, that that's the nickname of the modern day enterprise <laughs> so i looked well, it up the, online the, and it's pronounced Lethe. Lethe. It's the name of a river in the 80s. Ah. Oh, that's right. I did uh, the River of Forgetfulness or something. Yes. The River of Forgetfulness. So what do, what do you suppose that references in this episode? Uh, well, let's see. We, we were talking about, uh, you know, before we started recording about... Um, PTSD and how we thought maybe that Lieutenant Tyler was going to explore some of that because he's been in captivity for a while and that's a traumatic experience. But uh, who the person we see really exhibiting it this week was Captain Lorca. Oh, yeah, I mean, uh, so mm. clearly he's got some things that maybe he would like to forget. Do we want to do a quick like overview of the episode. We should, yes. So uh, we we've got uh, the usual A and B plots going here. We we started having that regularly on uh, uh, Star Trek Discovery. We've got uh, Sarek being uh, basically uh, the subject of an assassin- assassination attempt. He is, uh, his ship is blown up en route to a peace conference with a couple of Klingon houses uh, that we are told might be able to, you know, go renegade and, and help us uh, take down Cole's uh, alliance of Klingon houses. Uh, he is assassinated or nearly assassinated by a member of his own species, Vulcans, who are apparently logic extremists um, and don't, like what's happening to Vulcan society because of contacts with humans. This definitely seems to be kind of a reoccurring theme with Discovery because you got the Klingons who are kind of um, fearful of uh, contamination. Yeah, the, the remain Klingon kind of um, the, the the phrase that they repeat. And then you've got something similar now going on with the uh, um, Vulcan extremists, which I mean, this certainly isn't the first time that uh, uh, Star Trek has kind of delved into this uh, idea of uh, Vulcan extremists. Yeah, yeah, it's not not the first Vulcan extremist we've seen. Um, uh, some in Enterprise come to mind for sure. Yeah, uh, there was also that one. Remember, was it Gambit's parts one and two of uh, mm-hmm. ENG, where you had the uh, the Vulcan who was uh, uh, kind of basically going to use uh, the ancient weapon to yes. I, I suppose you could also count um, any Vulcans in the Maquis DS Nine as well in that. Well, I think is one of the things that I was reading in a recap uh, that was posted online of the episode is that uh, it, it's not out of the realm of possibility that any ideology can have people who take it to the extreme. 
and and Vulcan logic and you know the teachings of Surak are are no exception to that. Well, I suppose the idea is that they're fearful. They they have the concern that logic will be polluted with emotion. That the 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 idea of logic itself is not something that the other species of the Federation really particularly share and so that's that's really a point of difference a point of of something that just people the vulcans can rally around that can they can um use say we stand out we are vulcan and this is our central tenet and uh Sarek would be the poster boy for cultural contamination because of course he's married a human he adopted a human he's raising a half human son uh so it makes sense that they would go after Sarek if they're worried about uh, cultural contamination yeah so he's uh his ship got blown up or nearly uh blown up and he is drifting uh obviously burnham who uh when we first meet her in this episode she is uh mentoring cadet tilly on her way up the ladder um a friend of mine called it the michael burnham school for wayward cadets <laughs> which i like and, i mean and which, tilly isn't really wayward though she, she, i mean she's just she's a little awkward that that's about yeah that's about all <laughs> well at the very least it kind of got burnham out of her uh, little serious funk so yeah she she's coming out of her shell a lot which i like I, i'm really liking that and i think i think tilly is helping her do that and actually uh lieutenant tyler is helping her do that uh they they get a little friendly in this episode oh a little friendly yes well no, nothing <laughs> like it's more implication and in, innuendo than anything but yeah <laughs> yeah they're not quote they're not going there yet <laughs> Uh, but but she does seem to be opening up a lot, um, which is a good thing for her because she was a very closed off character when when this all started. She, she is, I think, she is becoming, a, particularly at the end, much more of a human. Uh, take a much more on a more of a human perspective on things than than purely the 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 cold logic of, of Vulcan that she uh, grew up with. It's good. It's, it's, it's taking the, uh, the Deep Space Nine uh, philosophy of character development. Character development is king, along with context. <laughs> um, so obviously she is, uh, because of, she's got a piece of his katra in it, uh, she's able to sense that Sarek is in distress and uh, goes to the captain to, or well, doesn't really go to the captain. She collapses and the captain uh, is there when she wakes up in sickbay and begs him to... Go rescue Sarek, which I liked that he really jumped right into that. Um, I feel like one of the, we're, we see a, just like a ton of sides of Captain Lorca in this episode, and one of them is his loyalty to people uh, and people on his crew, especially because he, he's you, developed. Go ahead. You, you, you got to think though, if he's got some kind of ulterior motive, and well, that is that is that is something for speculation. Uh, but it, it's I've, definitely something that I'm thinking of that. Yeah. I would argue against that because, I mean, it doesn't make sense for Lorca to go after uh, Sarek just if he just needs Burnham. Because, I mean, he could come up with any number of excuses not to uh, go after Sarek. I mean, he's basically defying orders to pursue this. So, I'm not sure. I mean, he's definitely got some of kind of affection for uh, Burnham. And I'm not sure yet what that is. It could be maybe that he sees something of himself in her, like another broken kindred soul, so to speak. Um but, yeah, I mean, I I think he does it for her. I mean, yeah. and it, this is a guy who often has multiple reasons for doing things, but I think his primary reason in this case is for her. Because I think we do also see parts of that, you know, loyalty to his his crew um, in his sort of bonding with Lieutenant Tyler, who he's now got on the ship and offers the role of uh, chief of security. Yeah, uh, just to go on that, I thought it would be weird that he would literally go, you bring her back safely or you don't return at all. <laughs> yeah, that was that, the. I I, th- I think I that caught on that too. Little, you know, motivational. You know, I he didn't mean that. I think he was just, he was just saying yeah, what people it, do. It's it's like it's like one of those jokes that hits just a bit off, and you think, I wonder if there's like an an element of truth behind it. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, clearly, maybe he's cultivated. Burnham is really important to him. Like, yeah. and yeah, I mean, I think we'll find out later exactly why. Burnham is so important to him. I mean, I, I yeah, think I mean, he, he kind of cultivated that side of him himself, you know, an image that the crew has of him, um, that he is slightly dangerous, even though he, he wouldn't actually, you know, hurt Tyler or anything. If he, if something happened and Burnham got killed on the mission, you know, he'd be, he'd be royally pissed off, but you know, but he's, he's planted that, that seed, that idea that, yeah. you know, oh, the captain is, you know, oh, he's a ruthless guy. Yeah. Well, he's, he sort of is, 
but we'll, we'll, we'll leave that till the, the rails in part a bit later on. <laughs> yeah. So um, once they go off on the on the rescue mission, uh, because they have to go in a shuttle, because the nebula is going to interact with spores badly, um, we get the B-plot starts, which is uh, Admiral Cornwell, who uh, I just realized uh, earlier this week that I saw um, a long time ago in Sports Night as a supporting character. Uh is sort of an obscure Aaron Sorkin show, if anyone is not familiar with it. Um, she shows up in person, in fact, <laughs> to basically uh, tell Captain Lorca, uh, you know, everything he's doing wrong with his life. Yeah, pr- which pretty much is everything. Mm-hmm. Um, she thinks she's a- he's out of control, uh, bas- in part because of how he told off the Vulcans uh, in his uh, takeover of the search for Sarek. Yeah. I mean, this is also a continuation of the last episode where she uh, sits down with him and was like, uh, are you sure you're okay? You're being weird. <laughs> not listening to orders, being confrontational. You're not respecting the chain of command. Clearly they've got a lot of history. Yeah. It definitely seems yeah. like they, they are like old friends. Like they came out through the ranks together or something. Yeah. I'm not really sure how, how, how I would describe their relationship beyond like, I think there's definitely some kind of um, romantic element before the well, the um the uh before she came in admiral and and he was under her but um, you get the sense that they have a prior yeah relationship in that sense that you know may, maybe they broke it off years ago when she became a superior officer or something like that and uh, I suppose that what leads to one of the more interesting theories that I've heard is that uh Borka is actually a mirror universe from the mirror universe <laughs> I'm not sure I That's buy it. that one. <laughs> Now, see, that's interesting because I just read a thread now that, okay, so so last week everybody was all, all about, you know, okay, Tyler is actually Vogue in disguise. That's the theory. Yeah. yeah He's that one I have a hard time dis- disputing. I, <laughs> I just read a theory that says Lorca is actually Vogue. No, no, it's not. Yeah, no, it's I, not. I, I'm not buying that one. <laughs> Long must he have been a, been a um, captain in Starfleet for that to... Like Vogue, yeah, Vogue couldn't have. I, I just don't see any opportunity that Vogue could replace, but replace Lorca. But um, <laughs> I mean, that, Ash could definitely have been replaced if we we're going to yeah. you follow it, that. It, it's still very possible. I mean, obviously, there there was one thing um, in one of the very first scenes where they're doing their little combat drill on the not a holodeck. Uh, <laughs> it. Um, it really Ooh. obviously seemed like Voke, w- or if, if Voke is Tyler, he's really done his Okay, so I w- do want to take a moment to talk about the uh, the holiday. Or the sure, yeah. holiday. So uh, this was actually pointed out to, I saw this on Twitter, someone else posted this. Uh, TNG did not introduce the holiday. The animated series. The animated series did. They had, they called it the rec room, but they yeah, had a hol- it, it was holiday. Capable of, yeah, it was capable of generating holograms of things, and it was, it was not quite what we think of as a holiday yeah so do, do we do we actually see any like interaction between like direct interaction between the the crew and the holographic environment well, uh, other than I, shooting the klingons not really i think you they know, hit a not... button on the door but beyond that and of course the focus slides across the floor which isn't necessarily count but yeah, they probably had a real floor <laughs> um it, it was cool nonetheless i mean you know some you know, some laser tag going on there. It's pretty cool. But yeah, so I mean, phase attack. Get right. Yeah, I, I did find phase that interesting attack, though yeah. that uh, uh, in theory the original Enterprise did in fact have a holodeck of sorts, albeit well, one, you know, it's, something it's, it's, that they couldn't they could didn't show until they uh, had a uh, animated budget. <laughs> lots of people are going after uh, Discovery for you know the sort of uh, technological anachronisms of you know technologies that uh, look way way more advanced than the original series which is only 10 years after this. That's because modern uh, day looks way, way more advanced than <laughs> the original series. I mean, there, there's there's just no way to get around that. Enterprise well, looked more you, advanced than the original series. I'm with you on that. I, I look at it as a sequel to Enterprise rather than a prequel to TOS. Um, the, the one thing that I'm really in- interested in seeing what they do is this ball drive, because that is a technology they've introduced that I will sure they will like deal with why it's like, it, maybe it doesn't come later on in the series, or maybe it's it's a reason for something else, or maybe it's tied to something else. But um, it, it, see how the the spore drive develops in within the Star Trek universe, anyway. Yeah, I'll be honest. I mean, it's already a pl- problematic 
thing. In fact, that's one of the uh, um, accusations that uh, Cornwell levies against Lorca is the uh, use of eugenics to get the spore drive working. Um, which which well, is we... something that I was surprised they didn't address more in this episode. I mean, we, we have this setup of um, now the, the essentially the navigator for the spore drive is Stamets. And what is that going to be doing to him? Yeah, so it, it's not only eugenics that I find interesting. It's it's the whole Stamets is just like ho- completely high. He's, he's just like... Yeah, he's he's out. Oh, he's yeah. bonkers at the moment. So he... <laughs> He is the Queesat's Hatterack, that's for sure. And, uh, yeah, just, just like a chief... I'm not sure if he's chief engineer or if he's just uh, the... Uh, he, he is this... actually chief engineer. Uh, he's listed as such on a readout that we saw in a previous episode. Okay. Um, there's, so, probably yeah, the... a, there's probably another guy who drives, but he does the sport drive, chief engineer part. Yeah, so the does the Discovery even have a conventional warp drive? Well. Yeah, it's got oh, warp yeah. Right. cells. Okay, we, we 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 saw it in previous uh, before okay. they got the spore drive really working. Oh, that's right, because they they would have had to have warped. Uh, yeah, um, but yeah, a chief engineer who's that just out of it that that's got to be breaking some Starfleet regulations just just with that kind of stuff. <laughs> Let yeah. alone and, the the genetic manipulation. Yeah, I mean, it, it is clearly doing something to him, um, but it's not a focus of this episode, which yeah, I but, I thought it probably would have been. Which is kind of interesting because, I mean, in previous episodes, we've kind of done a uh, a setup follow through cadence where at the end of the episode, you set up for the next episode and then you explore it in the following episode. And this episode deviated and we didn't uh, actually uh, explore the setup from last week at all. And it looks like it's this week's going to be the same where uh, um, we have a setup and then it looks like next week we don't actually get to see the, uh, the fallout from we're getting, that yet. We're, we're getting maybe, you know, some wa- longer periods of time to go through different plot threads now rather than set up and then pay off in the next episode. Yeah. Um, so I'll tell you one of the things that didn't work for me in this episode, which is the some of the bits where Burnham goes into Sarek's mind. And that's always a tough thing to represent of, you know, someone going into someone else's mind because we really don't have a frame of reference for that in real life. Um, you know, Star Trek in the past has done things like, oh, a person's mind looks, looks exactly like the Enterprise <laughs> because those yeah. are the sets we have. <laughs> yeah, they didn't um, uh, and, and, do too much with it. I mean, it was pretty basic. It was like, it was just the same setting and a few. No, I saw, <laughs> no, I sort of get their explanation because like in universe, it's he's thinking in his dying moments about his greatest failure mm-hmm. as, as, a, as a parent or whatever. Uh, in relation to Burnham, and and that definitely would be be uh, what we find out during that is is that that would be something that I think would be a reasonable explanation. But I, I just don't think that they made it otherworldly enough. Like they made it, yeah, it was too real in a way. It, which too, is, it looks too yeah. realistic. It, you know, everything yeah. is sharp. You know, if they would even like blurred the edges of the screen or something, that might have made made it even better for me. Um, but I think you're right. I think the emotional content of it works. Yeah, and, well, I mean, and it's and it's very good. I would say I don't feel like it quite reached its full potential. I felt the cadence of the uh, that particular part of the plot, it was okay. It wasn't great. Um, they they could have played up the mystery a little more about what's going on in Sarek's head. Um, but it, they kind of uh, there, there wasn't a lot of uh, like problem or mystery and problem solving involved in that part. Mm-hmm. They're just kind of a keep going at it until we finally get through. And, and for some reason that involves hand to hand combat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there, there I are mean, all sorts of Sir, can kick you, ass. Apparently. Like how else would you represent middle combat? I mean, it's, uh, it's, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, uh, what was it? What was that maybe, episode maybe of TNG with, uh, combat. with, uh, Laksana in a coma? Oh gosh. Can't remember um, the name of the episode. Uh, what, what I always come, remember is um the one where bashir is attacked by a lethian and he's and he's in his head yeah. yes uh, was, just, oh, see that was clever time. yeah <laughs> it was probably i think a little more clever than this yeah it yeah i mean if, if they had, if, had taken a little more time to really flush it out i mean i think they could have uh, gotten a little better back and forth and kind of played around with people lead, led people around a little more versus uh, uh just kind of do a few fights have them argue a bit then have it fall like, like come out with 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 the DS9 episode, that the whole episode was was basically result, revolved around this thing. It was based entirely the episode, really. There was yeah, only maybe a, like a little bit epilogue at the end where it 
it actually like explained things. Um, and so I think they were able to take the time both in uh, within the episode and within you know just plotting it out, making sure it was working well. Just just when writing the episode, just to make that feel better. Um, I would say in terms of regards to the discovery that Ash's insight did help to just reframe the way she was approaching the situation not 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 see it as see it for what it was not seeing it for what she thought it was yeah i liked that he had that good input there um you know it's it's deepening his character now i'm actually hoping he's not a klingon agent myself personally <laughs> Uh, if he is, yeah, he's if he's playing an agent, he's a really, really good one. He is. Um, Darn. But so, at the same time, the longer Volk doesn't show up on screen, the more that theory is just going to fade <laughs> straight. Uh, the, the one thing that I'm really thinking about is that, uh, particularly when you're in, in like big cities such as Seattle or Sydney, for in, with, it, with me in Australia is that you're very like regionalized because oh I I I I'm I I'm not one of those central inner city kind of people I I'm a western city or I'm a southwestern or a, you know that kind of thing and when you go to somewhere that is not even actually in the city pr- proper like a, a place that's technically out of the city that kind of distinction would be even more important so that for me is the, is the big big hint or big thing that makes me think that um there's something going on with ash but i mean you could always be going well it's it it's in that area it's well see on the other hand um because so so what what the thing is here is he he says he's from seattle and then the captain comes back at him goes well you're actually from this which is just outside of seattle it's not in seattle itself and so why did you say you're from seattle (laughs) is is the question um, so I'm from what you could almost call the Denver area in, in Colorado and the actual town city of Denver is very, very small. And it's, it's all of the suburbs, uh, around it are huge. And when you meet people who say they're from Denver, oftentimes they're not actually from Denver. They're from Arvada or Lakewood or whatever. Um, and, and there was one time in college, I met somebody who said they were from Denver and I assumed that they were not from Denver. <laughs> and, and then she told me, it's like, no, I'm actually from Denver. It's like, Oh God, really? <laughs> So, I mean, you know, sometimes in metro areas, you know, you say you're from Denver, you say you're from Phoenix, but you're actually from one of the suburbs. Well, I I would personally count the suburbs as part of the city, but Mm -hmm. if if something like, um, like in, let's say in Sydney, there's a place, uh, southwest, there's a really small place called Picton, which uh, is so close to Sydney, it might as well be in Sydney, but it's not actually Sydney, if that makes any sense. Yeah, it's the, these big metro areas uh, that that have kind of an overarching identity, uh, even if you're not from what is technically that city. So, I mean, my experience, uh, people will actually give different answers depending on whether or not what they think your knowledge of the geography mm, that's true. is. So, I mean, if I was uh, like over in Europe or something and uh, somebody asked me where I was from, I might say Indianapolis, even though I'm not in Indianapolis, because they've never actually heard, would have heard of the town I'm actually from. Yeah, well, I would, like, I'm not in Sydney, I'm somewhere, like, out much further out west in New South Wales, but there isn't really any similar place for me. So, like, I would maybe say, like, regional New South Wales, or out west, or just say New South Wales, something far more generic. But that wouldn't really, yeah, which, which doesn't really tie down to any one specific location. But, um, yeah, I do get your point. So, um, they eventually do uh, figure out how to uh, reach Sarek and get him to turn on the uh, ship's beacon so that they can find him. Uh, and then actually rescue him off screen, <laughs> which I thought was a strange choice. Um, I, I mean, once they found him, it's just it's just a matter. Of, the stress was working out where he is. Once once yeah. they found him, that was that was just just yeah. Yeah. Say something interesting about uh, Star Trek Discovery is that they're making space look different than it's ever looked before. I mean, especially that nebula. Oh, that was that was pretty garish. That nebula, really. Yeah. Actually, it kind of reminded me of something out of the original series. <laughs> <laughs> really? Exactly. Well, all they could do was like throw flashing lights up on a <laughs> on a uh, piece of cellophane or something. Oh, yeah. that yeah. Um, the first Federation uh, satellite that was like a tumbling cube or something. Yeah, <laughs> that, that um, Windows screensaver. I don't know. Maybe maybe it's deliberate. Maybe they're trying to evoke some things from the original uh, series. Uh, I would. 
definitely say that is a strong possibility. Which is a good which thing, we, I, I think. Which we got, actually got a name drop of not only the Constitution class, but the Enterprise herself. Yes, we did. Which, I mean, we so kind we, of figured we know was the Enterprise is flying around, which it should be. And, and, and it should be flying around under Captain Pike as well, mm. which, which he was name dropped in the previous episode. Sure. Along with Captain Robert April, which was interesting, Robert April was the uh, uh, very first name that Gene Roddenberry had for the captain of the Enterprise when he was writing the first treatments for Star Trek. And, and then he was also, I think, a character in the animated series, right? Yeah, he showed up in the animated series, but um, there's, I mean, there's obviously debates about whether or not uh, um, the animated series is canon. Um, but, I mean, so a lot of people got excited because this was like the first on screen mentioned in a live TV show of uh Robert April. Yeah. Uh including the person who who made the original uh animated series episode. I saw him tweet the other day. He said, you know, 40 years later and it's finally canon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or something like that. Yeah, so at, at least it's confirmed canon because there's no way yeah. you can say the discovery is not canon. So Robert a- April is a, is a person. Well, let's not go that far. People are going to try and say that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we, um, we all know there's fans who are just so opposed to this show. <laughs> yeah, but we won't we won't go there. Um, so anyway, uh, you know that that's kind of the a plot, and then you get the resolution with uh, Burnham and Sarek, and it and it's it's a very emotional resolution for her. Um, but it it reinforces um, basically the Sarek that we see in the original series, the sort of very closed off, um, really terrible father kind of Sarek. <laughs> Uh, you know, he is that guy in, in Discovery yeah. as well as in the original series. Yeah, someone else pointed out to that uh, this kind of really gives some a frame for the uh, animosity between uh, Sarek and Spock because yeah. Spock turned down the like the thing he had compromised to get or to get yeah, Spock he, into he, the Science Academy. He compromised Burnham's future in in a way um, in order to give that opportunity to Spock uh, because you know once again we see the uh, Vul- Vulcan prejudice towards humans um, and then when it comes time for Spock to go to the Science Academy he turn you know he chooses another path not the one that Sarah had chosen for him at personal cost so it, it it's a call forward which is great uh, and informs that relationship. And and so, what did you guys think of uh, Amanda, Swack's mother, who we see in this episode? Um, I thought she was okay. We we didn't get to see much. That's the yeah. thing. We um we we see her introduce the uh, Alice in Wonderland, uh, sort of paying off stuff that happened previously. Mm-hmm. Um, and we right. see her be emotional, which is a human thing, but we don't really see. Well, I mean, we saw much. Amanda be emotional in the original series, especially when she's freaking about about Sarek dying and Spock not helping him. Um, well, actually, uh, yeah, yeah, you're right. Um, but I but, would you say know, it's, she's an actress f- that I've seen in other things and and in somebody that I I have liked in things like Defiance for for one. Um, so I was kind of I was kind of interested to see how how they do this. And and you're right, there's not much material there yet. But yeah, I would say there's not see more? nothing about a performance though that really to me oh this to tying into a, the amanda from the original series um yeah it's it was okay i mean it wasn't a terrible performance but it, yeah i didn't really just, like, just a, jump just out a nothing piece of the flashback nothing to jump out and scream oh amanda <laughs> <laughs> well um I, obviously my my prediction that we will see a lot of flashbacks on the show has actually not come true this is really the first one we've seen since uh the first of the two-parter yeah uh opening but we might get more i don't know well didn't they say that we would see more of like Georgia? Well, I thought so, and but all we've seen is that hologram for starters. Yeah, no, maybe that's uh, what they meant. Say, but because uh, we're on episode six, so we got nine episodes left in this season. Ah, which brings me to the other big news of of the uh, week here is that uh, we it, it has been officially renewed for a season two. Uh, so the big question stuff. is going to be uh, is when will we see season two? Because they were talking, <laughs> there was talk beforehand <laughs> that uh, we w- it wouldn't if they did get a season two, it wouldn't. Uh, um, show up until uh, 2019. Yeah, we, yeah. We, we know that there's at least going to be um, a break, like a group of, what, nine episodes in the first half of the first season? Yeah, and I, then believe the we, remaining I believe we've got three, I we believe we've got three left, so that'd be nine in the, in the first half, and then uh, it'll pick up in 2018 with the remaining six episodes. So um, we know they just wrapped production on season one just in the past couple of weeks. Uh, so they, you know, they'll definitely do a hiatus before they start filming season two. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it, it could be 2019, it could be the end of 2018. 
it's hard to say. Well, I mean, the writers were basically talking about the fact that uh, they wanted to take extra time to really kind of nail down season two, kind of take a look back, see what they did, what worked, what didn't. Um, I think one of the things that I remember them saying is that season one would really wrap up the Klingon war arc. Yeah. So season two will be something completely different, which would be cool. Interesting. Yeah. Um, so so, so we'll, we've, we've only got what, like nine episodes remaining to see see um so what what happened with the 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 house Mackay and what happens with with the um klingons joining are they going to to resolve be friendly or are they going to just start a cold war or what's you know what's going to happen with that but i suppose some of that we should already know but anyway i am just rambling we we can only speculate because i, I one of the th- nice things about the show is it has uh, defied expectations so far or defied mine uh w- which brings me to another uh point of this episode uh which is the bedroom scene <laughs> with uh <laughs> captain Lorca and admiral cornwell um who who probably did not exercise exactly good judgment there in uh, sleeping with captain Lorca, yeah. but um she provokes something in him and he reacts quite violently and apparently sleeps with a phaser under his pillow <laughs> uh, so, so, so obviously wait, not yeah. only does he sleep with a phaser under his pillow but in like in the very last shot, he's got he has a phaser on him, so it's like he has a phaser on or near him at all times, no yeah. matter. This is clearly a guy with deep seated emotional issues, at least uh, trust issues, anyway. Like, yeah, yeah. That but said, I'll tell you I one mean, thing. Go ahead. I was gonna say for an admiral who has a background in um, counseling, she really is quite terrible counselor. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Just tell tell the guy that you're doing that you're going to do all these things when you get back, and sure he's going to rush at getting you back when <laughs> things go wrong. That's surely going to happen. So this kind of gets us to the uh, the big I don't want to call it controversy, but the uh, I know a lot of it didn't sit a lot sit well with a lot of people is the uh, um, Lorca's decision to they. So they find out that the Admiral is kidnapped when she uh, takes Sarek's place on the uh, peace docks. And, and he uh, basically volunteers her to do that. Yeah. Now, I don't know for sure that he actually knew that it was a trap. Um, <laughs> um, I mean, he'd be silly not to not to consider that as a possibility. But I, th- I think maybe he was just trying to at least get her off his back for a little bit. Yeah. By um, himself some time. If nothing else. But I'll tell you before before we go on real quick, uh, as far as you know, defying my expectations, I thought for sure when when they're talking in the bedroom and she turns her, he's got the phaser, she turns his her back on him. I thought for sure he was going to shoot her in the back. That would and have I been didn't think that really dark. I didn't think that would be good. <laughs> I did not think that would make it a good scene. <laughs> yeah, and and I'm very I'm I'm very glad that they defied my expectations and did not do that. <laughs> a variation on that, and this is the one I was kind of waiting for, was that the shuttle was going to be ready to explode. Yeah, or something, or something <laughs> like that. I, <laughs> so yeah, that that oh, was my oh, worst. Oh, 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 like a navigation failure. So like. Uh, but, he well, didn't go that far. Is, what what he does is very subtle in, in in like essentially volunteering her to go. So there's there's a very subtle variation on that of you know trying to get her out of the way in some sense. That's my take on it. But in any case, uh, he he does not jump to her rescue when when they find out she is taken. Which I mean, I guess there's a certain irony in the fact that he is uh, uh, behaving in exactly the way that she wanted him to behave back at the beginning of the episode. Mm. Of not except running it's off also, half cocked. Except it's also a sign of his um, instability, instability, and and trying well, to hold on to his command. Pathology, kind of. Okay, yeah. pathology is a good word. Um, Pat, yeah, pathology is a good word. So this kind of gets to. And I don't know. I was talking with you guys about this at the beginning of the sh- or before the show. Um, um, we t- we kind of touched on this last week with uh, Ash Tyler and the potential of him c- kind of exploring the uh, ramifications of PTSD. Mm-hmm. Uh, Following this episode, I am 100% convinced that it is, in fact, Lorca, the one with PTSD. And I would even go oh, so yeah, far absolutely. as to say that his command is his crutch, um, much like uh, like alcohol would be with someone else. Um, you, so, see, you see him break down when she threatens to take away his command. I mean, yeah. just completely break down. And, mm. and I, I don't think that's necessarily him trying to manipulate her. I think that's a real reaction. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but so, you, you, but I, you see these scars on the back of on his back when during that scene with the uh admiral um and just some of the things that he's gone through is is just just visually you you get the hints but you know we 
really don't know exactly what. Yeah, you don't necessarily know where those scars came from. Is you know, was it from the the torture by the Klingons, or was it from, you know, when his ship got destroyed? Was he injured in that incident? You know, his previous yeah. ship. We we still don't know the full circumstances of that because you yeah. you have to ask yourself the question of. How was he in a position to destroy his ship and get off of it <laughs> yeah. without his crew getting off of it as well? You know, we, we saw the um, the original Admiral um, in uh, the first couple episodes uh, destroy his ship with himself on it is the implication um, to take out the Klingon ship that was ramming his own. Um, so, I mean, it, yeah, it's, it's, hard, it's hard to fathom how that happened. Yeah. So, I mean, that'll I think that'll come out later. I think that's a point. Um, I absolutely and- do not think we are done the with this uh, particular thread, um, there will be consequences of this decision and he'll have to either mm-hmm. face that decision and, uh, or and it, he'll probably yeah. lose his command. <laughs> it's hard to see how he keeps his command after the war is over for one, for sure. But yeah, I mean, you know, this kind of gets back to the, they're, they're going to take him. He's a captain Maxwell kind of character. You know, they're going to take him and shove him aside after the war is over. If he lives through it. Yeah. I mean, uh, I don't know, but I mean, it kind of gets back to that. Although also the, that fact that that for background in counseling, the admiral was a really terrible counselor because yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, she, 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 she like, she really goes after him. And that is, is basically yeah. the way to, that's, that's not yeah. going to help him. Yeah. Fortunately, make her to be, that'll just make her an enemy rather than make her, make him actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, well, she basically issues. was threatening to take away his, is the one yeah. thing that he's, is holding him together. And so, and that, that's why I thought I was like, Oh God, she, he's going to shoot her in the back. <laughs> um, but I'm glad, I'm glad they went more subtle. Yeah. But I mean, yeah, I don't think, um, I, I think it'll either end up being, he has to rescind his decision or he, uh, has to face the consequences of that decision. I don't think so, this is something, something he'll sweep under the rug or be able no, to sweep no. under the rug. Yeah. The thing is, I, I'm not, if she does get rescued, how are they going to make it? So he's still, keeps his i don't know i mean i i have given up trying to predict uh where yeah discovery will end this is an unpredictable show and that's that's good i like it um i mean there's there's too many times where i mean you know something being predictable is not necessarily a bad thing i mean you can still have a, a something good even if it is predictable um but keeping you guessing and and defying expectations uh it is also good. It keep it makes things fun. Um, it makes it so that we can do podcasts like this and speculate wildly and be wrong. <laughs> I'm plenty happy to be wrong about some of this stuff. Well, uh, yeah, uh, uh, we'll just have to wait, watch and see, which is slightly annoying because we actually have to wait and see it instead of you know <laughs> being able to watch everything at once. So I do want to point for out one sh- last for a show thing. like this. I would like to have been able to do that, but. <laughs> <laughs> Um, that ship is sailed. You had mentioned uh, earlier you comparing Lorca to Captain Maxwell, and I think he, ver- yeah. it's very much the case. Um, uh, but I will, also, I will also point that out that's the, that's the captain from Beyond. Uh, uh, it's the captain from the TNG episode, The Wounded. Um, it's the guy who was in the Cardassian War before the show, and then um, he kind of goes on a little bit of a rampage because he thinks the Cardassians are uh, planning to start a war again and, and rearming and the enterprise is sent to bring him back. Well, it turns out he's right. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and that was kind he, of the, he's also, he's also clearly suffering from post-traumatic stress. And isn't ultimately O'Brien who like beams over and talks him down. Mm-hmm. Oh, he's that's very, right. Very um, O'Brien was a former, um, uh, crew member of his, wasn't he? Yeah. All right. So I am going to make a prediction then. I am going to say that Burnham is going to be the one to ultimately help him kind of confront his uh, demons. I think I think Lo- or Burnham I, I, is going to be the one to yeah. talk him down when uh, like things spiral that. out of control. Um, you know, because it's not going to be Saru who does that. I think. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. Yeah, no. I, I, I don't I like think you, that's Saru. No, <laughs> <laughs> that's just not um, not his way. Saru is a yeah, Saru is a great character, happening. but is not one that confronts. Yeah. No. Because, you know, like when, when Janeway goes off to the deep end, it's, uh, you know, it's Chakotay that comes and talks her down um, or sometimes seven of nine. <laughs> uh, but, um, you know, it, he and Saru are not going to have that kind of relationship, but he and Burnham could. I see that happen. So um, we, one thing that I, I, I did like to see in this episode is uh, we got to see a new Vulcan. It's kind of interesting looking and, and it. It had a few things that were reminiscent of Vulcan ships that we've seen before. Um, the warp ring? Yeah, it's sort of a two-part warp ring as far as nacelles go. And then the the front of it where he walks in is actually kind of reminiscent of uh, the original Vulcan ship from 
first contact. And actually, I, I saw somebody point out a screenshot earlier today that you actually do see that ship in the background of the flashback. Yeah, I, 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 I just, just... really... <laughs> I really just need to... to uh, I've only really seen it once, so a lot of those details uh, I haven't been able to have the opportunity to, to notice, but um, there there are a lot of Easter eggs and 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 call callbacks to um star trek um it, it pretty much in every in every scene in every episode and they've all done that uh, all the different uh, star treks they all have easter eggs calling back to previous star treks um or other things sometimes you know like the millennium falcon that showed up in the uh <laughs> battle, battle in first contact <laughs> yeah uh the um the, the books in the um i think it was, must have been the first episode it was definitely the first one of Captain Giorgio's, where um, the TOS episode names. Yeah. Uh, so let's see. So we got um, preview for next week's episode, uh, which is going to involve some sort of monster of some kind, some cre- some kind of creature. And Harry Mudd is going to be back. And apparently a time um, loop. And some sort of time loop. A short one, yeah. like 30 seconds or something like that. A lot going on for a single episode. Yeah, no mm. kidding. Um, Do you reckon Harry, Harry Mudd's going to cause the time loop? <laughs> I, I would I would have to say yeah maybe um, so I, I I'm not sure how that's going to play out because you know one one of the shows that I really liked recently that unfortunately just recently got canceled is called Dark Matter um, I like that one and it kind of had the the same sort of uh, grounded and serious plot lines but then they threw in sci-fi tropes for almost seemingly no reason like a time loop and I don't think it really worked for that show very well. Uh, I'm not yeah. sure how it's going to work. It didn't really quite do anything new. It was basically kind of a rehash of the thing that uh, SG-1 did, which was more or less a rehash of uh, Groundhog Day. Day. (laughs) TNG got Uh, creative with there. It's like, Everybody does a time loop episode. You know, everybody does a, a alternate universe episode. Everybody does a time travel episode. You know, and, and I would like to see Discovery not do some of those things because I don't know if it fits with the more serious geopolitical plot lines spore drive spore drive is the cool science fiction thing that we're doing so yeah to- but, so like the spore drive can open up a whole lot of things because we, we we we've heard that they're actually doing a mirror episode so mm-hmm. you the spore drive might be involved in that maybe i i can see that happening uh because we are we obviously uh, clearly have some interdimensional things going on with that yeah as in seeing the um the the, the mirror reflection of Stamets without his partner in the uh, fourth, <laughs> well, fifth episode must have been. Yeah. Um, I've actually seen people uh, speculate that maybe that uh, the Stamets we have now uh, as of episode six is, uh, is actually the mirror Stamets because he's so happy. <laughs> 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 and that is clearly an indication he's from an alternate universe. Is there anyone we haven't accused yet of being from the mirror universe? <laughs> Some people I don't think, think the whole accu- show is We haven't accused Ash of being from the Mirror Universe. He's always been a Klingon infiltrator. Yes. I don't think we've accused Saru of being from the Mirror Universe. <laughs> How would we know? Tilly is just too positive to be Mirror Universe. I yes. can't see that happening. Okay, so so one last thing before before we end this episode. Um, the the scene with them in the mess hall where she's ordering breakfast for Tilly. Um, first of all, I clearly am on the Michael Burnham diet because I love breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, then you have the computer you're saying, uh, you know, a fantastic, healthy breakfast for you. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I just wanted one of them to just mutter under the breath, oh, God, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, like the computer is doing this every time, and it's like, you know, just the whole crew just rolls their eyes at it. An excellent source of antioxidants. Yeah. The only problem is it parades you when you order anything unhealthy. <laughs> <laughs> no, what I think is that they would make it healthy. Like they would make substitutions and and uh, they would make it look like what you ordered, but it it, it like they would do something molecularly molecularly. I'm just going to ignore that and uh, yeah, <laughs> molecularly. Um, Yes. To the um, to the food. Yeah, I think you're probably right. It's it's all this the same materials, just you know, synthesized in different ways. I can tell um, you right now, because... fat does not taste like not fat. <laughs> 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 all right. Well, uh, I think that will do it for us for this episode. So uh, thanks everyone for joining us, and until next time, enjoy the final frontier.